Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start at the very least on my review of Slaughterhouse 5 by Kurt Vonnegut. So I've been meaning to get to this for ages. I'm, I would say I'm a Vonnegut fan. I've read maybe half a dozen of his books, but I've not got to any of his most famous ones, of which this is the most famous. Uh, it's about the bombing of Dresden. I am going to read you the blurb, and then I'm going to check out my tabs. I'm only on page 12 at the time of writing. Um, it's not super long. It's only 150 pages. But yeah, I will update you as I, as I go along and let you know what I think. So... Dane reads. Prisoner of war, optometrist, time traveller, these are the life roles of Billy Pilgrim, hero of this latter day pilgrim's progress, a miraculously moving, bitter and funny story of innocence faced with apocalypse, and the most original anti-war novel since Catch-22. So, we have right at the beginning the introduction to this, I just thought this was quite well written, um, which you would expect to be fair from Vonnegut, but we've got uh, title page, Slaughterhouse Five, or the Children's Crusade, a duty dance with death, Kurt Vonnegut Jr. A fourth generation German-American, now living in easy circumstances on Cape Cod and smoking too much, who, as an American infantry scout hors de combat, as a prisoner of war, witnessed the firebombing of Dresden, Germany, the Florence of the Elbe, a long time ago, and survived to tell the tale. This is a novel somewhat in the telegraphic schizophrenic manner of Tales of the Planet Troll Famador, where the flying saucers come from. Peace. Nice. And so I think this is quite a famous opening line. It begins, all this happened, more or less. The war parts, anyway, are pretty much true. And he says, um, he, he asked an old war buddy named Bernard V. O'Hare if he could go and visit him. He says, I had the Bell Telephone Company find him for me. They are wonderful that way. I have this disease late at night sometimes involving alcohol on the telephone. I get drunk and I drive my wife away with a breath like mustard gas and roses. And then speaking gravely and elegantly into the telephone. I asked the telephone operators to connect me with this friend or that one from whom I have not heard in years. So I thought this was, this was pretty interesting. Uh, he writes, I have told my sons that they are not under any circumstances to take part in massacres and that the news of massacres of enemies is not to fill them with satisfaction or glee. I've also told them not to work for companies which make massacre machinery and to express contempt for people who think we need machinery like that. So we get a reference to a bulletproof bible. A bulletproof bible is a bible small enough to be slipped into a soldier's breast pocket over his heart. It is sheathed in steel. I thought that was just like an urban, urban myth. We get a use of the word flappingly. We also get... Um, a vibrator called Magic Fingers, which made me laugh. It is actually, um, it's like bolted to a mattress of a, a bed. And I'm sure housewives would love that. Billy finds an afternoon stingingly exciting. I think this is what uh, all of these, these adverbs and adjectives, um, they just, I found it really hard to fall into the story because of them, because they were just so clumsy and clunky, you know? Um, and we also get this like, this element of uh, aliens in it as well. <laughs> I uh, just want to read you this, this part because I thought this was quite deep. It would take another earthling to explain it to you. Earthlings are the great explainers, explaining why this event is structured as it is, telling how other events may be achieved or avoided. I am a Trofamadorian, seeing all time as you might see a stretch of the Rocky Mountains. All time is all time. It does not change. It does not lend itself to warnings or explanations. It simply is. Take it moment by moment and you will find that we are all, as I've said before, bugs in amber. You sound to me as though you don't believe in free will, said Billy Pilgrim. If I hadn't spent so much time studying earthlings, said the Tralfamadorian, I wouldn't have any idea what was meant by free will. I've visited 31 inhabited planets in the universe and I've studied reports on 100 more. Only on Earth is there any talk of free will. And I thought this was cool um, because this is kind of how this book is meant to be read and a lot of Vonnegut in general. Um, and it's just an interesting take on fiction. There are no telegrams on Trofamador, but you're right, each clump of symbols is a brief urgent message describing a situation, a scene. We Trofamadorians read them all at once, not one after the other. There isn't any particular relationship between all the messages, except that the author has chosen them carefully so that, when seen all at once, they produce an image of life that is beautiful and surprising and deep. There is no beginning, no middle, no end, no suspense, no moral, no causes or no effects. What we love in our books are the depths of many marvellous moments seen all at one time. The Germans find Billy to be one of the most screamingly funny things they'd seen in all of World War II. Enough with these, just, it doesn't work for me. Never does. Um, we get Rosewater saying to Billy, everything there is to know about life is in the brothers Karamazov, but that isn't enough anymore. We get another time Billy heard Rosewater say to a psychiatrist, I think you guys are going to have to come up with a lot of wonderful new lies, or people just aren't going to want to go on living. Uh, we have Kilgore Trout is in this, the fictional uh, science fiction writer as well, which is cool. And I just thought this was interesting, bearing in mind the sort of gender politics that goes on a lot today as well. 
There were five sexes on Tralfamador, each of them performing a step necessary in the creation of a new individual. They looked identical to Billy because their sex differences were all in the fourth dimension. One of the biggest moral bombshells handed to Billy by the Tralfamadorians, incidentally, had to do with sex on Earth. They said their flying saucer crews had identified no fewer than seven sexes on Earth, each, each essential to reproduction. Again, Billy couldn't possibly imagine what five of those seven sexes had to do with the making of a baby, since they were sexually active only in the fourth dimension. The Tralfamadorians tried to give Billy clues that would help him imagine sex in the invisible dimension. They told him that there could be no earthling babies without male homosexuals. There could be babies without females female homosexuals. There couldn't be babies without women over 65 years old. There could be babies without men over 65. There couldn't be babies without other babies who had lived an hour or less after birth, and so on. It was gibberish to Billy. And I just like this little tombstone here. Everything was beautiful and nothing hurt. Great little line here. Go take a flying fuck at a rolling donut. Go take a flying fuck at the moon. And this was just interesting because we're on 8 billion now. On an average, 324,000 new babies are born into the world every day. During that same day, 10,000 persons on an average will have starved to death or died from malnutrition. So it goes. In addition, 123,000 persons will die for other reasons. So it goes. This leaves a net gain of about 191,000 each day in the world. The Population Reference Bureau predicts that the world's total population will double to 7 billion before the year 2000. I suppose they will all want dignity, I said. I suppose, said O'Hare. And they go into, a, they create a corpse mine in Dresden. Um, there were hundreds of corpse mines up and by and by. They didn't smell bad at first, but wax museums. But then the bodies rotted and liquefied and the stink was like roses and mustard gas. So it goes. The Maori Billy had worked with died of the dry heaves after having been ordered to go down in that stink and work. He tore himself to pieces, throwing up and throwing up. So it goes. So a new technique was devised. Bodies weren't brought up anymore. They were cremated by soldiers with flamethrowers right where they were. The soldiers stood outside the shelters, simply sent the fire in. Somewhere in there, the poor old high school teacher, Edgar Darby, was caught with a teapot he had taken from the catacombs. He was arrested for plundering. He was tried and shot. So it goes. So yeah, Slaughterhouse 5 by Kurt Vonnegut. I can see why uh, it's considered such an important work. And uh, yeah, very well written, very moving, and uh, always interesting to learn about the Second World War, especially about Dresden from somebody who was there. I didn't mind the alien stuff, I thought that was cool. Um, I didn't like all of the adjectives and adverbs, some of which I pointed out. They just really janked me out of the book and um, kind of hampered my enjoyment. So because of that, I gave it a 4 out of 5. But it was, it was good. Not, not Vonnegut's best, though. So there we have it, that's what I made of Slaughterhouse 5 by Kurt Vonnegut. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.